Yeah, thanks very much. Um, also, I would like to thank uh, for the invitation um, and to give a talk here. Uh, I'm very much honored. Um, well, the title of the workshop is 30 years of wavelets, impact and future. I'm afraid I cannot really report on 30 years of wavelets because 30 years ago I was still in elementary school and learned how about how to add numbers and <laughs> multiply. So. Nevertheless, um, wavelet theory was, was certainly um, a very big uh, thing in my scientific life. In fact, um, even before coming to university, I played around with uh, image compression and then heard about wavelets, and this was something that was a bit mysterious to me at that point and didn't understand it very well. And, but then I was crazy enough to take a course on wavelets in my second semester of studies. Um, yeah, I found it quite interesting and, and, and influenced me quite, quite much and uh, yeah, uh, my, my further work sort of built on that and on, on the ideas. Okay, so it, it was already uh, mentioned in, in some of the talks like uh, of by Albert and Michael Unser that compressive sensing is, is one of the offsprings of wavelet theory. And uh, in this talk, I would actually like to directly connect um, compressed sensing with uh, sort of the sister of wavelet theory, namely um, time frequency analysis, and see um, how one can do compressive sensing with uh, time frequency structured random matrices. Okay, let's start. Um, yeah, so this is what was what already was said in a few talks. So uh, one of the impacts of wavelet theory was certainly um, the understanding that, that sparsity is very important for um, signal and image compression and also other stuff like the denoising and inverse problems. And um, indeed, well, you have seen such pictures, uh, I guess, a lot. So this is a picture of my son at the age of 10 days. And now we are cruel and wavelet transform him. So this is what you get. And now we are even more cruel and delete some of the coefficients by setting them to zero. And if we transform back, well, not much has happened. So my son survived. Um, um, okay, the question is whether the fine details are important here or not, but anyway, um, so here only 2% of the, the wavelet coefficients are retained and all the others are set to zero and you basically don't see a difference and so this shows that we have actually a sparse expansion and, and this is uh, good to describe um, real world images. Okay, as was already said, one of the next steps in uh, well, coming off from wavelet theory is compressive sensing. So here, sparsity is a crucial ingredient, but we don't use it for compression, but rather in order to, to reconstruct uh, signals or images from incomplete information. So if you a priori think you have not enough information to to recover, um, compressive sensing tells you that if there's some sparsity uh, underlying the whole business, then uh, often you actually can. Okay, so here's an example. Um, we have a, a signal, well, here's the Fourier spectrum of the signal, only 10 coefficients are non-zero, the other ones are, are zero. And if we look at the time domain, it looks like this. And now we take 30 samples and, well, the dimension of this, this uh, thing is 300, so it's a discrete problem. And certainly trying to recover um, the this, this signal from just 30 samples um, seems impossible. And in fact, if you look at the traditional 
reconstruction me method, uh, L2 minimization. Um, I mean, what you get is this, and if you compare with the original uh, Fourier spectrum, you basically get garbage. But now if we do sparse recovery, compressed sensing, we get back this image, which is exactly what we started with. And when, when people observed, well, people around Candes and uh, Justin Romberg, I think actually Justin Romberg did the very first numerical experiment in, in this area. Um, well, they were very surprised that they get zero error because usually in numerical analysis you get some error, but uh, here there was no error. And, and so thinking about this problem actually started the whole area of compressive sensing and especially making um, the analysis precise, not just doing numerical experiments, really um, uh, had a lot of uh, fruitful um, results and impact. Okay, so let, let me go to, to mathematics. So we speak about uh, sparse vectors in finite dimensions. So these are, are vectors where only um, S coefficients out of N um, are actually non-zero. So N you should imagine very large and S uh, significantly smaller. And well, often in practice you do not have exact sparsity, but at least you can approximate well. And in order to quantify this, we introduce the error of best S term approximation, um, which is the error you make by replacing uh, your vector with a sparse vector in the best way. And we call X compressible if, if this quantity is small or decays quickly in S. Okay, now what's the compressed sensing problem or compressive sensing? I mean, that's the same thing. Um, we start with, a, with an S sparse vector and we take um, measurements, meaning we apply um, a matrix, so a linear transform on it and get to see why. And now the interesting case is that the number of measurements is much smaller than the, uh, than the signal length. And um, if you want to reconstruct, of course, we get, first of all, an underdetermined linear system of equations. And we know from linear algebra that there are usually infinitely many solutions, so we have to figure out the right one. So, no, uh, n well, not knowing anything about x, uh, this is cer certainly impossible, but, but we have this sparsity prior. So, so uh, the hope is that knowing, in addition, that only um, S coefficients are actually non-zero, gives some hope that this is possible to, to recover. Of course, the difficulty is here that we don't know a priori which coefficients are, are non-zero, otherwise we could, could reduce uh, to a smaller system and, and solve, solve, on, um, solve for X on that smaller system. And um, of course, we would like to have a fast algorithm to, to actually do the re reconstruction, which is in some sense maybe the more surprising fact that one can do this with a fast algorithm in the end. Okay, so, well, the naive approach for doing this would be a zero minimization, so you're tr trying to recover a sparse vector, so no, why not go for the sparsest vector consistent with these linear measurements? Unfortunately, this approach is NP-hard, so not feasible in practice. And so one of the alternatives, probably the, the one which is best understood by now, is a one minimization. So you replace this, well, the zero norm is not really a norm, so you actually replace it by something convex, so, so this norm here, and um, yeah, well, have the, put this constraint, which is the same, and, and take the solution, which, which has the minimal L1 norm. And this is a convex problem, and, and so there, there is a bunch of algorithms to, to solve this uh, quickly. In fact, I think the optimization community was quite happy that compressed sensing came up with this problem. And so th there was a lot of activity going, going on and trying to find um, fast algorithms to actually solve this. Anyway, um, so the question is, well, we replace this uh, zero problem by L1 minimization. 
And um, well, now the question is, um, do we really get back the original vector? Do we get back something sparse? Um, in fact, um, well, one can show that basically always one gets uh, back something sparse, but still the question is, do you get back the vector that you started with? Um, and one tool to analyze L1 minimization and also other algorithms is the restricted isometry property. Um, so we introduce these constants delta S of a matrix, which are the smallest ones such that this chain of inequality holds for all S sparse vectors. So on the set of sparse vectors, basically A is nearly an isometry. And if you think of a, of a sparse vector, it has a certain support. So applying A to that vector is the same as restricting um, A to, to the columns indexed by the support and applying it to the reduced vector. And this shows that basically you want that all um, sub-matrices with S columns are, are well conditioned. Okay, so it's a um, strong requirement, but once we have it, um, there's the following result. Um, if delta 2s is less than 1 over square root of 2, um, then L1 minimization reconstructs every s sparse vector from y equals ax. And not only that, we can make recovery stable um, by um, passing from, well, exactly sparse to approximately sparse vectors and also by adding noise on the measurements. Um, Okay, so yeah, this is an important property. And the question is which matrices actually do satisfy it? And what, what are actually, what is always interesting is to, well, maybe you specify S and then you want to know uh, what's, what's M. Um, so how many measurements do you need in order to recover a sparse vector of sparsity S? So um, it's actually an open problem to, to um, give explicit uh, matrices with small restricted isometry constant for reasonably large uh, S. And um, well, there was a little bit of progress by Bourguin and co-workers, but this it was literally an epsilon improvement over uh, known constructions. So in the end, it, uh, people realized that uh, random matrices are much easier to analyze and you actually get optimal guarantees for those. So um, one simple model are Gaussian and Bernoulli random matrices. Here you take all the en entries of the matrix independent and normally distributed or just plus or minus one with equal probability. And they satisfy delta S less or equal to delta with, with high probability if uh, this relation holds between M, S and N. So in particular, the important thing to note is that M scales linear in the sparsity uh, up to this logarithmic term. So um, if the sparsity is small, then you can choose also M um, much smaller than N and still be able to um, recover uh, the signal why L1 minimization, for instance. So this is, uh, well, simplifying this a little bit, um, I mean, that's the basic relation that you need. And, and when, if one passes to different matrices, one, one would like to show something on, on, on that, in that spirit. That, I mean, that, that's the optimal uh, scaling. Of course, um, well, if you remove the log factor, um, you cannot have a, well, better scaling than this because basically this tells you that uh, well the number of measurements is um, okay the basically the complexity of the problem is is you need to uh, estimate the, the non-zero coefficients there are s of them and so you cannot work with less than s measurements that's that's clear and but you also cannot remove the log factor because there there are some lower bounds which prevent this Okay, so um, well, thinking about applications, 
Gaussian and Bernoulli matrices, um, well, they are nice for the theory because you get the optimal bounds, but, but if you think of an ap application, um, the question arises, uh, why should, should a matrix describing a measurement process be a Gaussian matrix? Uh, well, Gaussian is, is nice because it tells you basically most matrices uh, are nice, but, but still uh, you will not have any structure if you generate a random matrix, and usually in, in applications you want um, structure. And, um, and so often you have just limited freedom to inject randomness in, in the process. And the other reason why you want structure is that in the end you want to use these matrices in an L1 minimization program, and um, usually the optimization algorithms use, use uh, matrix multiplications with, with A and, and the transpose, and um, so you want, would like to have a fast algorithm like, like the FFT in order to, um, to speed up these algorithms. Um, and in fact, um, usually you say compressed sensing is something in high dimension, where it's interesting, and so if you think about Gaussian matrices, you will never use that in high dimension because then solving these L1 minimization is basically impossible. Okay, um, so um, what is, has been studied quite from the beginning on by, by uh, Emmanuel Candes and uh, Terry Tao and Justin Romberg were, were partial Fourier matrices. So here you, you basically generate a submatrix of the DFT by, by selecting rows at random, which corresponds to random subsampling of the Fourier transform. Uh, now in this talk, I would like to uh, study a different uh, structure, namely uh, time frequency structured random matrices. And um, this connects certainly uh, to my time at Nuhak, um, where uh, people, well, look at time frequency analysis since also 30 years, probably, um, more or less. So, so, so how old is time frequency analysis? <laughs> uh, okay, so, um, so the basic operator in operators in time frequency analysis are translation and modulation. Um, so the difference to wavelets is the, uh, is the modulation operator that you have instead of the dilation operator. And here we are looking at it in finite dimensions. So um, the interesting objects now in ti time frequency analysis are the time frequency shifts. So that's the concatenation of, of a translation with a modulation. And in dimension n, you, you have then n squared operators. Now um, we fix a vector and apply all these time frequency shifts to this one vector and put it as columns into a big matrix. So um, the columns have dimension n and we have n squared columns. So we get an n by n squared matrix and the question is, can we use that matrix for compressed sensing? And in particular, if we can do so, what should be the choice of G here? Okay. Um, one motivation is, is wireless communications or, or radar. Um, so think of, of um, the, the channel identification problem in wireless communications. So um, here you can represent an operator as, as linear combinations of time frequency shifts. Basically, well, by the way, the time frequency shifts for, form a basis for C n times n, so you can rep uh, represent any operator like that. But um, for wireless communications, this uh, uh, representation is very useful because because the, the uh, time shift basically corresponds to the distance of, of an object because of, well, finite speed of light. Um, and, and the frequency shifts you have due to the Doppler effect if, if objects are moving. And so, so usually um, a scene um, uh, encoding the, the channel um, consists only of a, f a few scatterers at well, some locations and with some speeds. So you can expect that this is actually 
sparse. And also in radar, you get something like, like that, um, uh, basically uh, representing um, also, like if you have some airplanes f flying around, the time shift corresponds to the distance and the frequency shift to the, to the speed of, of this airplane. And now, so the idea is to, to recover this operator or this channel by probing it with, uh, with a vector. So you, you send the vector um, through this channel, so you know what G is, and you observe Y, and you want to guess what, what the operator is. And um, of course, in general, you cannot uh, do so by just probing this one vector, but um, but if, if actually that operator has a sparse expansion, you get a sparse recovery problem. Because if you, you write out gamma applied to G, well, you use that representation. And that's actually here. These are, are the, the columns of this time frequency um, shift matrix, matrix or Gabor synthesis matrix. So it's actually psi G applied to X. And now if if x is sparse, we can apply compressed sensing. And now the question is how to design G. Um, if it's really this operator identification problem, you may have the freedom to choose any G that you like, um, but we want to find one which, which is working well. Okay, and in the end, um, well, since it's hard to de de to analyze this for, for deterministic G, we, we use a random G. So a simple way would be um, to simply choose a, a so-called Steinhaus or Rademacher sequence. So, so in Steinhaus, all the entries are independent and uniformly distributed on the torus. And in Rademacher uh, case, we just choose them as plus or minus one with equal probability. So you start with this one random vector, and then you apply all the time frequency shifts and put, put all this into this big matrix. Um, first of all, this looks a bit strange because usually you think about, when I mean, you think about time frequency analysis um, as G, I mean, that's the Gabo window, you would think of it's good to take something which is well concentrated in time and frequency. And now we could do the complete opposite because such a vector will, will be completely delocalized in time and frequency. So also the frequency, the Fourier transform of a random vector will be more or less flat. Um, so why, why should this be useful in this context? Well, basically, um, we don't know which a priori which coefficients x are, are present. So you basically need to co collect um, with each measurement information about x and say in the time and frequency representation. So basically for this reason it's good to have something which uh, where the time frequency content lives basically everywhere. Um, okay. So the question is can we prove something for, for this matrix? And uh, the first result is the following. Um, that I, I, well, achieved that with the Scott Funder some time ago. Um, so we can choose G as a random Steinhaus se sequence, and if the sparsity is less than n over log n, then with high probability, L1 minimization recovers x from y equals psi g x. Um, and that's, well, n is here also the number of measurements and the, the size of, of the matrix is n square, so n log n square is basically log n. And so this is, this is optimal if you compare to this, these results for Gaussian matrices. But um, we didn't prove the, the restricted isometry property here. Um, so, and uh, also we don't have a, or didn't get a stability re result at that point. And so we continued thinking about this problem and it turned out that the restricted isometry property wa was much hard, harder to obtain. Um, uh, well, fr okay, first of all, some numerical experiments. So um, this axis is 
1 over n, or the number of measurements divi divided by the signal length, and the vertical axis is the sparsity divided by uh, the number of measurements. And um, so these curves here um, separate the region where we get always recovery from the ones where, where you get never recovery. And basically, um, well, these these curves indicate that this works as well as, as Gaussian random matrices. So, so this, this w is, is really a good matrix for, for recovery. Now, um, okay, so as I said, we were also interested in the restricted isometry property and uh, basically I started thinking about this when I was still in Vienna with, uh, with Nuhag, but then it took until 2012, so basically five years to actually prove this. Um, and it turned out that we um, needed to develop some new tools in, in random matrix theory or stochastic processes. So let me first give you the results. So if the number of measurements scales like the sparsity times these log factors, so a bit more log factors than in the Gaussian case, uh, but it's just log, so um, doesn't measure too much. Um, then with high probability, um, the restricted isometry constant of this time frequency structured matrix is small, and so we can do recovery via L1 minimization. And in fact, we had a previous result um, where we had a strange scaling here, basically the number of measurements scaling like S to the 3 half, and getting from here to here, um, well, took us some effort. Um, okay, and I would like to, okay, the question is how much time I have. Um, so when did I start? Uh, okay, um, well, let me say a little bit. Um, okay, so, so the restricted isometry constant is the smallest constant such that this chain of inequality hold, and, and an equivalent fo formulation is that delta S can ex be expressed uh, like this uh, supremum, where you take uh, the x over this set of um, uh, unit, or, well, well, this subset of the unit ball restricted to s sparse vectors. And now in this case, we have that ax is, is psi g of x, and we can replace, um, well, g is now, say, this uh, Steinhaus or Rademacher vector, so we can write it in that form. And so the idea is now to reverse the role of X and G and introduce a matrix Vx, which is this one. And now Ax is the same apply as, as Vx applied to epsilon. And this is a, a so-called chaos process, which can be written like that. And now here um, X varies. And we want, would like to get the supremum over, over this double sum. And, um, okay, well, maybe I'm go quickly over this. We, we need so-called gamma functionals and um, entropy numbers. These were concepts defined by Talagon, and I think uh, if you didn't see it um, before, I would need a bit more time to explain this in detail. In any way, it's, it's a measure of the complexity of a set. And um, the result we derived in the end is that in expectation, um, if you replace this set of specific matrices by a general set of matrices can be, s uh, can be estimated by this gamma 2 function essentially and, and the uh, diameter of, of the set in the Frobenius norm. And uh, we cannot not only estimate the expectation but also derive a tail bound. And so this was work with Felix Kramer and Charles Mendelssohn. And, um, and well, the, the crucial thing is that in a special case, uh, we improve a result by Talagon, um, who considered general processes of that type, but the, well, the, um, well, the bad term was this one, which is actually gamma one functional, and thus this always led to this exponent s to the three over two. And now if, if we want to estimate this in our case, we get in the end that this gamma two functional can be esti estimated by, by this term. And if you want to make this 
less than one, you need the scaling of n linear in S up to this log factors. And of course, now estimating this term requires time frequency analysis. Okay, um, I talked about uh, time frequency analysis and compressed sensing, but let me anyway connect also to the topic of wavelets um, uh, in compressed sensing. So um, one reason why it's important for compressed sensing is the sparsity is uh, often a good assumption. Um, well, that's very vague, um, but they also has uh, been worked on actually stu studying that in more detail and looking at the interplay of the sparsity assumption and wavelets uh, and the measurement matrix. In particular, if you take partial Fourier uh, measurement, which, which arise in magnetic resonance imaging and where it's often useful to assume sparsity in wavelets. Um, and it turns out that you actually have to be a bit careful then um, because it turns out that if you s take samples at random according to the uniform distribution, which you would think is the natural thing due to theorems by Candes and so on, this turns out to be not a, a good thing, but you should actually change the probability distribution and putting more mass uh, to the origin, so sampling low frequencies with higher probability than, than large frequencies, which intuitively is, is the right thing and was also observed uh, um, numerically by Lustig and co-workers and then uh, Kramer and Ward and Adcock and Hansen uh, actually did, did an analysis of, of this. Um, it turns out that also like modeling with desert spaces and weighted sparsity, you can actually also um, consider smoothness in, in this business. So, so I'm working on this with a PhD student, um, so it's not yet finished this work, but uh, we hope to publish it soon. Um, and also what is interesting, well, TV minimization is also an important concept in, in image processing, and actually you can analyze that also, like if you take partial Fourier matrices, and as an intermediate step, you need to go to the Haar wavelet and, and study, study that. Um, um, yeah, first study uh, recovery using sparsity in Haar wavelets, and then you can connect it to TV minimization. And another um, thing which is also very current research is that you, instead of uh, wavelet basis, you look at frames and also like generalizations of, of uh, wavelets like curvelets, shearlets, or actually even GABA frames. And then it turned out uh, that it's good to pass to analysis space sparsity, so which was already mentioned in, in the talk of Jean-Luc Stark. And I think in the analysis of this, I, I think there is still a lot of uh, challenges. So this is something um, I think we will continue to see in the future. Then, well, one, well, the title of the workshop was 30 years of wavelets, impact and future. Um, well, I put a blank page because I cannot predict the future. Maybe you can imagine your uh, vision of, of the future of wa wavelets there. Uh, anyway, I think, I think that um, uh, wavelets will continue to play a big role, um, like in image processing and, and so on. Um, but, but not only wavelets itself, but also the ideas like nonlinear approximation, uh, which basically were studied in the context with wavelets, will, will continue to play, play a big, big role in the, in the future. So I think um, there is uh, a big future of wavelets and its offsprings. Um, well, I'm also doing a shameless advertisement, and I'm even more shameless than um, Michael Unser because I'm adding a second advertisement, um, which I have to switch. Um, so, um, in one year from now, there will be um, trimester program at the Hausdorff Center, uh, at the Hausdorff Research Institute in, in Bonn on mathematics of uh, signal processing. 
which is going on from January to April 2016. And uh, I think, well, some of you are already invited, but we also have a call for, for application. So if you want to participate or have students or postdocs um, that you think um, would like to participate, um, well, we allow applications, and the application deadline is April 30. Thank you very much for your attention.